I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Many attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both critical to our success. And we are also happy to welcome guests from beyond the RLP today, and we welcome you as well. Um, so I am thrilled to uh, introduce and welcome our speakers today, uh, Stephen White, Danny Johnson, Jane Miller uh, from Deakin University. And they're going to share with us uh, the, this exciting um, project and program that they've been working on. And I'm going to now turn it over to them. Um, and they will uh, self-introduce. So take it away. Thanks, Marilee. I wish to just begin by acknowledging that the Deakin presenters are gathered here today on the traditional lands of the Wudurrung people, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. Good morning, um, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Um, I'd like to thank OCLC and Merrily for having us present today as part of the Works in Progress series. My name is Jane Miller, and I am the Director of Digital Libraries and Repositories at Deakin University Library. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to provide a very brief overview of the university and the library before handing over to my colleagues, Steve White and Danny Johnson, who will talk in detail about the Deakin Genie Initiative and the library's engagement with it. Deakin University takes its name from Australia's second Prime Minister, Alfred Deakin, and was established in 1974, which makes it part of a relatively newer generation of universities in Australia. From its beginning, Deakin has had a strong uh, commitment to both on-campus and distance learning, and this has transitioned to a focus on online or cloud-based learning and digital innovation, both of which Deakin as a university is acknowledged to be at the forefront of nationally. Deakin operates across four campus sites and, strategic, and a strategically critical cloud presence, which we regard as another campus. The library reflects this with four physical locations and by placing significant effort in the delivery of digital services and resources. Deakin Library combines the provision of print collections and physical and virtual service points with an established and growing emphasis on electronic resources, student experience, digital literacy, support for research, learning and teaching, and digital innovation. In 2017, the university's eSolutions portfolio launched the Deakin Genie project. Deakin Genie is a smartphone-based virtual assistant, assistant that offers personalised information resources to students. DG is genuinely industry leading and has been recognised as such with a, a number of awards. The library's role in the project is an evolving collaboration that Danny Johnson, the library's manager of digital experience, will cover in some detail. However, first I'd like to hand over to Steve White, digital solutions manager from Deakin eSolutions, and have him set the scene and provide some insights into what Deakin GD is and can do. Thanks very much, Jane. I'd like to first start by talking about why we're doing Deakin Genie, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time on that because I think it's an important intro into um, to this product and, and how we're using it. So to start off, our, our Chief Digital Officer is a very broad thinker and has a real interest in digital disruption and transformation. And he speaks at a lot of conferences around the world, and he came back from one of these conferences in 2016 and said, we need a digital assistant, we need to be in this space. And we did quite a lot of investigation um, around this and we found that there are actually quite a lot, even in 2016, there were quite a lot of specialist digital assistants in the marketplace. So I've just got a few examples here. So there's things like personal finance coaches that tap into your account details and track your spending and saving, um, a virtual travel assistant that helps you to book rooms and hotels and, and flights a weight loss coach that helps sort of coach you to achieving your weight loss goals. Um, personal insurance was starting to be done via conversations. Um, and my personal couple of favourites, there's a do not pay um, parking ticket validity um, bot, which was developed by a 19 year old in London. And it successfully saved about, um, about $4 million in parking fees by guiding people through whether they can avoid paying a parking fee. Um, but look, my personal favourite is Ghostbot. Um, this is a, a dating avoidance text service, so perhaps if you've been on a date with a, a young lady or man and you're maybe not interested in continuing that and they're, they're messaging you, 
Um, it's a bot that um, gives uh, non-committal sort of vague responses that, that just generally sort of hopefully mean that they're not going to be interested after a little while. Um, this complex diagram I'd like to talk through um, where we were in 2016 and to some extent where we are now. Um, it, it's really going to help explain why this digital assistant is a thing and why, we, why we're betting a lot on, on this, this technology. Um, back in 2016 in particular, um, if you wanted to get to anything online, whether it be apps or web pages, you pretty much had to go through an app store or Google search. Um, and as far as Google search is concerned, generally speaking, you type some keywords in, you trawl through the first two or couple of pages of results, you'd explore a few links, hit the back button a few times, refine your search and, and eventually find what it is that you're looking for. And if particular results didn't appear, then those businesses were probably less likely to get that business and, and survive. And then when you did get through to the apps and web pages, there's a re very different look and feel. So there's a relearning process that everyone uh, goes through each time they hit these in terms of where they get their information and how it's presented. What we're starting to see now, and, and I guess what we what we felt was coming back in 2016 when we started this project is this sort of placing of a digital assistant in between people and the end things that they're trying to get to within apps and web pages. So. Digital assistants are acting as your agent. They're understanding your needs via natural language, interrogating apps on the web and returning with the options that best suit you. Um, and those in individual apps and websites, we, we see them starting to fade into the background and, and we're starting to see this already. Um, and if you think about it, this makes quite a lot of sense. We already employ tax agents, insurance agents, real estate agents to act on our behalf in areas of a lot of complexity and detail that we really don't need to know all of that detail. So in effect, it's it's just an extension of those roles, but having a, a digital assistant um, do some of that work for us. And what we're starting to see is that um, what, what we're calling a digital assistant arms race among the tech giants of the world. So if you think about it, Google has pretty much owned the front page to the internet for the past 20 to 30 years and has amassed its great wealth and power on the back of that. If another organisation was able to put a really smart personal assistant that people found useful enough to use regularly in place of search, they would effectively assume all of that power and control. So that's one of the reasons why we see that all of these tech giants have to have a presence in space and, and they're really pushing forward as much as they can to try and win that battle of which is going to be the dominant digital assistant moving forward. Now we don't necessarily know who that's going to be but we think that there's some some capabilities that that digital assistant will have, who, whoever it is that that, um, that leads in that space. So I'll have very strong natural language understanding. They'll have knowledge about you and your preferences there'll be artificial intelligence embedded into that experience to try and make it as smart as it possibly can be and, and to learn about you and your habits and, and, and what works for you. And also trying to have really smart hooks into a wide range of information and services. So getting over to Deacon now, at the time of considering Deacon Genie, we already had a um, an AI powered Q&A service in place for two years called IBM Watson. Um, and we learned a lot during that time um, about how people ask for things and, and, and what sort of value they might receive from the questions and answers that we provide. So the box in black on the left hand side of this chart is pretty much summarises what people were able to get at that time. So it was pretty much a question and answer service um, and it looked at the information that we had publicly available and summarised a, a really good answer for the student about relative to what it is that they asked. But we found that there were, really wasn't a lot of repeat usage. Students don't have a, a lot of questions individually, or at least they didn't, that, that uh, our service could answer. Because the, the information tended to be fairly generic in nature. So we knew that what we needed to do with Genie is get across into that green box on the right hand side, the really personalised services that would encourage reuse, um, regular use and, and higher value transactions more often. 
So in 2016, we produced a prototype of Deacon Genie to prove the concept, and we launched it to a small cohort of business and law students here at Deacon. We analysed their experiences with that and talked to them about how it could be improved. And in 2017, we expanded this to develop a version for all students at Deakin. And we launched that service early in 2018. And in terms of where we're at now, there's a video which I believe is going to be made available to you. Um, the technology doesn't support playing it here and now, but I'd encourage you to have a look at it. It's a very short video, only about a minute and a half long, and it'll give you a, a really quick overview of some of the things that Genie can do. There's a lot, a lot of colour and movement there, but I think it's worth you having a look at um, how it actually works in practice. But I'll move on to just talk a little, in a little bit of detail about some of the things that it does. So um, Genie has deep integrations with our learning ecosystem. So you can receive push notifications directly from our learning management system. You can ask for specific class resources and readings. So you could say something like, show me the readings for week one for marketing fundamentals, and Genie can do that. So it understands the, the language that, that you're speaking and what to do with it. And Genie can also do a lot of other things like help you with referencing, return library search results, monitor your loans and holds, and Danny's going to talk a little bit about some of the specific library services that we've, um, we've got available and how they work. Um, one of the key things that students still had frustrations with was their timetable and how to identify where they need to be and get there quickly. And one of the I guess the high level goals of Genie is to be really, uh, to offer a really frictionless, fast um, service that you just open up your phone and within a tap or two, you're there and you know exactly what you need to do, where you need to be um, to get yourself organised and mentally prepared for what it is that you need to do next. So Genie helps show your timetable and helps you find directions to your room. Now we have a sister application called Scout which helps you with wayfinding which we're integrating those services at the moment. And Jeannie also knows when your assignments are due and reminds you about other important dates such as when census date, which is the final date for when you're committed to, to paying for your units is, um, and, and services like that. Now, with regard to orientation, Deakin has over 60,000 students and I'd say probably 30 to 40,000 of those are on our Melbourne campus in Burwood. So orientation is a really quite a crazy time. And we're using Genie to help organise students to get to those sessions. So we, we publish a, a personalised orientation itinerary for them that summarises all of the different sessions that they need to go to for their course, as well as more general sessions to help them get embedded into university life. One of the things that we're considering um, is how do we how do we implement or, or uh, link through to chat and messaging. Now, the screen on the left-hand side is what we call a, a contact card. So part of what we've recognised early in the piece is that we don't want Genie to be trying to answer everything. There are a lot of complex um, and very personal things that we want a, a human to, to control. So part of what Genie will do is when it gets to the point at which um, matters become too complex or we think that a person needs to be involved, we'll hand over to a service area of the university and refer students to that service area via which channels they've got available. So they might be messaging, they might be phone, a, a location on campus or even live chat. So I guess part of Jeannie's role is really to, to answer many of the, the easier questions that tend to clog up our, our student services um, where they're repeating information that is available but maybe not easy to find, but then hand over to a person to really get that personalised service um, that's going to make a difference to their time at Deakin. And one of the things that we discovered as we were testing with students, which we've done throughout the development of Genie, is when students can ask Genie anything, many times they really didn't know what they could ask. They didn't know the breadth of, of what Genie could do. So we introduced um, what we're calling a quick ask function. So it effectively advertises some of the key services that we have in different areas um, of the university's operations to showcase what Genie can do for them and so that they, they start to get a feel for how they can use Genie for their benefit. 
One of the things that we also observed when we were talking to students about how they deal with university life at the moment, we observed this con constant dipping in and out of their study units. So students would often dip into each of, most students who are studying full time would study four units and they would be dipping into each of the four units at the start of the day to see what's changed, what messages have been posted, uh, what communications there are from their, their lecturers or tutors. And then they'd probably do it in the middle of the day and then at the end of the day. So there's this constant um, dipping in and dipping out behaviour which is really quite inefficient. Um, and, and not a great experience for the students. So we designed a smart briefing service which is effectively a, a short summary of some of the really high um, usage and high value services that students need to get to consistently throughout their day. One of the things that we're also introducing is checklists and tasks. So we know that there is a ton of information presented to students particularly as they're starting their first trimester at university and the ability to retain that information is very low, but what we're trying to introduce is the ability to have checklists about, around particular topics so that students don't have to remember everything about everything. They can go to a checklist and do what we call cognitive offloading, basically just forget about all of those things but bring this up when they need it. They know where to get to it and, and, and how to, to use it and it can basically guide them through um, a process that they may only undertake several times while they're here at university but don't need to know about for the rest of the time. And what we've found is this, in talking to students about this process, we really feel it's going to reduce that anxiety by making them feel confident that they have every base covered because that anxiety about not knowing what they don't know and where to find things is a real um, challenge for us at university with so many students and particularly with so many students who are studying um, from off campus so they don't have the benefit of turning to a student next to them and asking them uh, a question or going into a location on campus to see our student services. So again a, another goal if you like of what Jeannie is trying to do is to try and serve students 24-7 so when our, our, our services are, are not available to them and to try and get them answers at any time. So I'm just going to walk through quickly some of the, the comments that students have made about Genie as we've gone through this process. So I'm not going to read each of them out, I'll let you do that yourselves, but they really love the conversational nature of Genie and met the messaging experience is really intuitive to students of all ages. Um, now although messaging is generally preferred, um, students starting to catch on to the fact that they can actually talk to Jeannie using voice and it's actually quite good at recognising what it is that they're asking for and directing them to the right um, information or services. And we think that this is going to increase quite a lot more as um, voice controlled tech becomes more embedded into to daily life. They really love how Jeannie helps uncover information that they may not know about but at a time when it's really important to them. So Genie has the capability of delivering customised notifications to students so we can metaphorically tap them on the shoulder at times when they need a certain piece of information and if they want to pursue that we can, um, we can offer it to them via a conversation in Genie. And the other thing about Genie is that it's really built for mobile. Um, we have a, a student portal which offers I guess pulls through some information from our core systems but also passes off to those systems to do a lot of the, the work that they'll do in, their, in, in our learning management system but mobile really has quickly become the dominant device um, for our students in, in particular and it's I guess we're, we're starting to live in an on-demand world where it's really just not acceptable to wait even a few seconds for anything. Um, Genie has no navigation, no searching multiple results and we train it so that students are only ever seconds away from what it is that they need within Genie. And I guess one of the problems that we're trying to overcome here is this, the sheer volume of information on such a, a broad range of, of areas that a university has to cover. And university communications traditionally have been very verbose. Um, we tend to have tens of thousands of pages on websites talking about every possibility and we expect 
students to go to those websites and, and navigate through all of that and, and find the little snippet of information that relates to them. What we're trying to do with Genie is filter out a lot of that um, by knowing enough about what the student is studying and, and what's um, whether they're an international or domestic student, what stage of their life cycle they're at, and try and make sure that they very quickly get the information that they need without having to trawl through um, a whole lot of really wordy information. So in terms of how Genie works, I'll just talk briefly about how it responds. So we, we effectively have three levels of, of hierarchy within Genie's responses. We have level one, which is what we call Genie Conversations. So these are handcrafted, personalised responses to fairly common requests. And we can insert into those conversations um, rich conversational elements, media and microservices that go off to our core systems and return information like a timetable or um, prescribed reading lists, or all sorts of things that we, we get from our core systems. If Genie can't match to a response that we've set up within our conversations, it'll fall through to what we call Q&A. And this is the equivalent to the, the Watson IBM service that we previously used. And it's an AI curated answer service, which is sourced from our web and our knowledge bases. And it effectively, a student would ask a question and it would come back with a, a pretty plain text answer, perhaps with a hyperlink or two in them. But it's, it's pretty much ask a question, get an answer. And then if we find that Genie can't respond on either of those levels, so what it, whatever a student has asked for hasn't been seen by Genie before, we'll try and link them off to human support quickly. So contextualised handovers to the right staff members so that they can very quickly get the support that they need. But the real power from Genie isn't what students see. There's actually a, a, an engine that sits behind Genie that, that really is more of what Genie is than the actual interface that students see. And what this is, it's a conversation builder. It's, it's the ability to create a conversation tree whereby if you ask for a particular thing, it will take a student through a conversation tree which uses their context. So for example, whether they're international or domestic, um, the units or course that they're studying or the life cycle stage that they're at and routes them differently based on those things but also based on questions that we can follow up and ask them to clarify what it is that they want. So if you think for a moment about when a student comes up to someone in student services or in the library, often there's a few clarification questions and answers that have to occur before you can figure out what it is that they want exactly and how you can help them. And Genie responds in exactly the same way. So we build those, those um, clarification or what we call disambiguation conversations into Genie and then we, once we know enough about what it is that the student is looking for, we can launch them off to the thing of value that they're actually looking for. But what the conversation builder really does is it gives us full control of what Genie says and does. So it's easy to think of Genie and its AI capabilities as just magic and, and that it just responds because it's a you know an infinitely clever bot that, that you know, understands everything. It's really not the case. The AI capabilities at the moment are mainly focused around matching what people are asking for with the right conversation. But the conversations themselves are written by real people and monitored by real people and trained by real people so that when, when Jeannie sees something that a student has asked for that it hasn't seen before, it's actually a person that takes over and says, okay, the next time this thing gets asked, direct it to this conversation. And it's via that process that Genie gets smarter and smarter over the time. And this forces us to really change the way we look at how we communicate information. So traditionally, um, universities, like any other organisation, puts all of the information that we have up on a website. The website knows nothing about you or what you might want and you navigate through that information until you find what it is that you're looking for. But what it's forcing us to do is to model conversations, and we often do this manually with little cards on a table um, with subject matter experts in our teams to figure out how the conversation should flow and how it should link to conversational assets that we already have in the system. And it's a really, it's a really complex process, but when it's um, 
when it's joined together really well, it creates a really seamless, nice, continuous experience for the student that enables them to jump in at any starting point into a conversation and get a response that really makes sense to them and guides them as quickly as possible to, to what it is that they're looking for. So these are some stats from last year. Um, so we launched in trimester two of last year and um, I guess since then we probably end up with about 10,000 students by the end of the year. So that was in one trimester, which is approximately a three month period of time. Um, as of today, we're, we're at just over 20,000 students. And just to give you an idea of volume, we had about, last week was our orientation week. So classes hadn't actually commenced yet. And yet we had about 20,000 conversations go through Genie in that week alone. So you know, we, we've doubled our, um, our user base in approximately two months and we expect that to continue again um, throughout the trimester. And I guess when we see things like um, organisations like Apple embed this conversational experience with, or with businesses into the way they're building their technology, it really does validate that we're on the right track with how to service really large um, distributed cohorts of customers efficiently and, and in a, a really quite a personalised way. So we've recognised pretty early on that Genie is not just a valuable product to universities. So it's a viable option for many organisations that have really large member bases that they need to communicate with efficiently. Um, and we're currently partnering with organisations in the financial services, health and government, with really different sets of customers and really different needs. But Genie's are really quite a, um, quite a flexible um, platform that allows I guess allows service to very differing types of industries um, and, and allows it to be very customised to the experience that those organisations would like to offer. Okay, so look, I think that's probably enough about Genie more generally. I'd like to hand over now to Danny who's going to talk about how we've actually integrated that experience into the library um, and really that specific experience. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I think that was a really helpful overview of Genie and the broader digital assistant landscape. And it allows me to segue very nicely into what I want to talk about, which is the evolution of the library's involvement with Genie and the evolution of our thinking around its place in the library and in the student experience. And it is very much evolution, not revolution. So today I'll talk through a timeline of the library's involvement and activities in the evolution of Genie. I'll start in early 2017 and our uh, initial project interaction. Then I'll move forward into mid-2018 when we moved into an extensive period of UAT and first release into production. I'll talk about the period that spans late 2018 to current day when our focus has very much been around implementing reading list functionality. And I'll finish with some insight into how Gene is being used so far as well as some thoughts around what's next, 2019 and beyond. So in early 2017, Genie was in its initial development stages as you've heard, and the library was an interested stakeholder, but we were largely at arm's length, with Genie team very, very much leading the decision making around inclusions and exclusions, where the business value sat, uh, priority integrations and so on. We were approached by the Genie team through Steve to provide access to our internally built and our vendor APIs and some of our tech expertise. Um, to establish some integrations with three key services that the project team had identified could be under um, in Genie. And that was library holds, library loans, and library search. And just to clarify, when I refer to library search throughout this presentation, I'm talking about our discovery layer, which is the EBSCO Discovery Service, or EDS. These were existing APIs that were already being used to integrate these library services with other platforms, such as our student portal. So we had previous experience using the data and largely knew what was possible to achieve with minimal rework or development of those APIs. To be honest, at this stage, the library gave little thought around business impact, user value and future planning. Genie was at this point very much in development and all of this work was really about getting a proof of concept together. Effectively, this was a library handover of integration capabilities so that the Genie team could uh, see what they could do with them.
So it was around 12 months before we had any further substantial contact with the Genie project. In March 2018, we had a request once again from Steve uh, through the Genie team to complete some UAT to provide an assessment on how well the library's specific integrations and conversations were performing and make some recommendations on anything that needed to be addressed in preparation for release into production. So we initially tested on conversations, so how Genie um, handled a variety of library-focused questions based on questions that we commonly get asked at physical and digital library service points, and integrations, those whole, that holds loans, library search functionality and representation. So let's start with conversations. So Steve had done a fantastic job getting dozens of library focused conversations into Genie. These had been largely gathered from our previous knowledge base and from website FAQs and those kinds of places. Most conversations handed off to our library website content at some point rather than answering entirely uh, within Genie as such. It became uh, evident quite early in our testing that there were some significant gaps and in some cases inaccuracy in that content. This was probably more of a reflection on the data sources themselves, that is the knowledge base and the, the website FAQs, than on Genie's functionality, um, as well as a reflection on the fact that at this stage the library subject matter experts hadn't yet been involved in this work. So we embarked on an, a conversation uplift process through which we revisited what questions we actually expected Genie to be able to answer to students. We decided to look at our chat logs to inform this as we felt there were some natural correlations between our online chat service, which is hugely popular here, and Genie. There are also some key differences, of course, not the least being that there is a human at the end of our chat service, but the conversational element of both services does have similarities. So looking at our chat logs helped us to do two things. It helped us to define what students were asking for and how they were asking for that information. And that was really important for us in the context of Genie. So not only did, it, did we want the right questions in there, but we needed to start that process of training Genie to understand the different ways a student may ask for the same thing. It's important to note that there are obviously only a finite number of things that we expect Genie to be able to answer, and there are many, many different ways that someone could ask Genie for that. Obviously, we could never expect or want to identify all the variations, but it was important to at least consider the different pathways of getting to the same answer. So here you can see some examples of the types of questions we've set up Genie to answer. We have around 75 intents or unique answers in Genie. Intents could be, for example, uh, something like Burwood Campus Library opening hours or platform specific instructional materials such as an EndNote or a Google Scholar guide link, uh, faculty librarian contact details or book delivery information. But there is almost, as I said, an un unlimited number of triggers or questions that could lead to each unique answer. In reality, the questions can almost be as unique as the students asking them. As I mentioned earlier, we can do that uh, process of training Genie to match those variations with the right answers, but we're never going to capture every variation. Over time, Genie will get better at making those matches. What we didn't set Genie up to do was to answer questions that are very common in our library chat service, but we felt at this stage at least, didn't have a place in Genie. And Steve mentioned this before. That's those deeply contextualised questions, such as when a student gives us their assignment topic and asks for help finding relevant resources. Those classic reference interview type questions that our librarians work through with students, often in great detail. Genie's focus is on removing that administrative overhead, not in replacing critical thinking and digital literacy and research skill sets. In practice, actually, what we've found at this point is that very few, people, very few people actually ask Genie anything as such, either verbally or through typing a question or phrase. In reality, most people use the common library triggers in Genie to initiate conversations. And you can see some examples of common triggers here in this screenshot. They're effectively quick links to a conversation. We do wonder whether this is a behaviour that will change over time and we'll actively monitor that. And I think Steve just alluded to this before, that we're starting to already see students engage more with the, the voice activation side of things and the text activation. So let's move away from conversations and talk integration. Here you'll see two screenshots. The one on the left reflects the library loans functionality and the one on the right reflects library holds functionality. They, these both work in a very similar way. A student can ask Genie to view their loans or view their holds, and Genie will use our library API uh, to query that student's record and return the results. And that will either be uh, Genie saying, you do not have any items on loan or hold, 
or Jeannie will return the results as a swipeable placard, displaying item cover where available, the title of the, title of the item, its due date for loans, and its availability polls. Both pieces of functionality passed our testing pretty quickly last year as they work consistently and accurately. But we did recognise the potential for growth in the functionality. Currently clicking on the item placard takes the student to the catalogue record, which is absolutely fine, but we do think it would be more valuable to allow the student to easily complete the next obvious steps. For example, renew that item through Genie or cancel a hold. These are the types of functionality improvements we'll consider into the future. The final aspect of that mid-2018 UAT, user acceptance testing work, was around library search. And although I originally framed this in the context of the API integration of library search into Genie, really this needs to be separated out into two aspects. The conversation that Genie had with a student around search and the integration of the search functionality itself. It became quite evident as soon as we began testing library search that there were some significant concerns with both the conversation and functionality and that as a library we really needed to think through the implications and complexities around incorporating this into Genie. It's something we hadn't done um, in those initial stages of the Genie project. So I'll just explain how, uh, how library search worked originally in Genie. And as librarians, you may immediately identify some challenges as I talk this through. Genie conducted a keyword search of our discovery layer, EDS, through API integration. To trigger the search, a student asked Genie, search the library for, inserted keywords. They were shown 20 matching result cards. The student would have to horizontally swipe through all 20 results before seeing the final card, which linked them to the native interface for the full results list. This was obviously problematic for a number of reasons. First of all, how many university students actually find the necessary resources um, to receive keyword search? An actual keyword search, for example, on something like global warming, this is about half a million results in the native interface, and the sheer volume of results wasn't reflected in Genie. Why were those the best 20 results that Genie returned? Genie didn't make it obvious that there were many other results, and it didn't allow for filtering or refining of those search results. Librarians put so much effort into teaching, advising, championing search and research skills appropriate to the academic environment, and the Genie search experience significantly oversimplified the need for successful academic search. So if you work in an academic library, you know that uh, searching for library resources can be a really complex and challenging activity. To get better library resource search and to find relevant high quality resources, a student needs understanding of a variety of limiters and search strategies in order to refine their results. The original Genie interface attempted to simplify that search experience for students, but in doing so it did risk oversimplifying the search experience. This was not only helpful, but it was at odds with our our, the library's role in championing the growth of digitally, digitally literate search confident students. So what did we do about it? Well, we didn't want to remove that search functionality altogether at this particular point. We wanted to work through ways in which we could make it work better. So we kept search, but we made it less obvious that this was a function of Genie. Originally, library search was a common trigger highlighted within Genie and using Genie's promotional material, and we removed that. Then we looked at how we could manage student expectations through conversation. And that has its own slide because I just like that the quote. <laughs> so here on the left you can see the original conversation Jeannie had with a student who asked something along the lines of, how do I search the library? You can see on the left in the original conversation that Jeannie kind of suggests that searching is easy. There's this underlying suggestion that um, Jeannie can magically do the work for you. We modify this conversation to gently manage the expectation that Jeannie could somehow magically simplify searching and guide the student to refine their results and to understand better that there might be a little bit more to searching for academic resources than just asking Jeannie for the answers. And this is just a, de a screenshot demonstrating what that conversation now looks like in Jeannie. The second thing we did was we downgraded the search functionality itself. So we refined the interaction to more promptly send the students directly into the native discovery interface, EDS, to view their results. Instead of returning 20 placards for taking student, uh, that took students into individual uh, records, 
we downgraded the functionality to only return one placard that takes the student to the native interface to view all their results immediately. Note that we could have done the opposite and we could have upgraded library search to add more functionality. For example, author and title searches, refine to and so on. But at that point, uh, we weren't, and we still aren't, to be honest, clear on the place of search in Genie, library search in Genie. So we didn't want to invest significant UX design and developer resources into this, um, this particular functionality just at this point. And once again, this is just a screenshot demonstrating what search now looks like. On the left is the original, on the right is the current state. So everything you've seen to date reflects work done and released to real students in mid-2018. Now let's talk through the work that we've been doing since late 2018 and it's being released this week into production. Um, we've been doing work around implementing prescribed text functionality into Genie and this reflects an evolutionary step in our engagement with, the, uh, with Genie. The prescribed text piece of work was conceptualised and initiated by the library, researched and designed by us and co-developed by library Genie developers. It's quite different to the approach taken throughout 2017 and mid-2018, which as you've seen was very much, at least initially, driven by the Genie team. The key drivers for the library in undertaking this uh, specific piece of work were twofold. Firstly, to better support access to prescribed texts for our undergraduate students. We saw a real opportunity to facilitate that using integrations that weren't currently being harnessed. And secondly, to demonstrate and build library capability to innovate and lead space, enabling us to learn more about designing and developing content for an AI product like Genie, but also to extend our knowledge and expertise in the use of vendor APIs, particularly the TELUS API, which provides us with the prescribed text integration capability. So I hope you can see this uh, slide sufficiently. Um, what it demonstrates is the flow of prescribed text functionality. So a student can either type early uh, or use a commentary to initiate the prescribed text functionality. Genie will ask the student which unit they would like to see their prescribed text for and provide them with cl a clickable selection of the units for which they're currently enrolled. The student selects the unit code that they want and Genie will either return the results in a placard format, format or if no results are returned, it will say, I couldn't locate prescribed te text for that unit code, would you like to view all unit resources? We had to be very, very careful about that language, once again managing expectations through conversation, because it is possible that prescribed, te prescribed text material may sit outside of the health product if an ad academic is directly linked in the, at that online unit. So just because Genie couldn't return a, uh, a prescribed text result, it didn't necessarily mean that it didn't exist. We wanted to make sure that was clear. So this just demonstrates that flow in practice. And please ignore some of the gobbledygook you can see um, in those screenshots that relates to the fact that um, this is taken from a development environment. So you can see that um, SD test PT is a bit of an anomaly. It won't display for students. Note that also on the right, um, you can see the flow through to the native interface um, to access that prescribed text. Um, so a student can access um, using the native interface, but they can also uh, returns directly back into to Genie from that, um, from that screen. We are actually currently working with the vendor Talus uh, to align the API with their mobile friendly view. As you can see that, that that view at the moment isn't terribly responsible. It's still quite workable on a screen, but it's not, it's not mobile responsive. So how's Genie being used so far? So obviously we don't have any data regarding the prescribed text functionality. It will be released in the next couple of days. Um, but I do have some very conservative figures um, to show you. And these are conservative after speaking with Steve this morning and learning we might have missed an entire section of, um, of conversations that haven't been recorded. Um, so since the launch of uh, Genie in July 2018 through to mid-February 2000, uh, mid 2019, there's been over 85,000 conversations in total. And of those, about 5,000 library-specific conversations. This excludes several hundred conversations that relate to prescribed texts and textbooks that as of March, once our, our new piece of functionality goes live, will in some way direct students to a library conversation. The most popular conversations, and these account um, for around 90% of all library conversations in Genie, 
are around booking library study rooms and booths. That far and away is one of the most popular things that's being asked for through Genie. Viewing loans, the availability of library computers, library opening hours, and library research is still in there, even though it's not an obvious thing um, that you can initiate through a common trigger. The data does still indicate that common triggers are by far the most popular way to initiate a conversation. And at the moment, booking a library uh, room, viewing loans and availability of library computers are all uh, common triggers that can be initiated by students. So where to from here? So it's become very evident that we need to consider how to operationalise Genie into library processes. We've started reviewing our digital content management approach to apply a more unified approach across multiple platforms rather than trying to tack on new processes and strategies to deal with Genie in isolation. Genie is part of our digital ecosystem and it makes sense both from a student experience and from an internal efficiency perspective to consider the whole rather than deal with our various content platforms in quite separate manners. We've also started documenting potential iterative improvements for existing integrations and conversations to make better use of the smarts of these ingenious. Some examples include extending functionality of the loans integration to better enable actions such as renewing loans through Genie or building upon existing holds functionality to allow students to do things like cancel holds. We're also considering better integrating current conversations that take students off to our website to complete actions such as booking a library room um, and asking about library opening hours. We think we can do better using API integration. Each of these obviously needs to be further investigated to determine use case and value. Of course, iterative improvement will only come through time as Genie is used by more students and we have the opportunity to undertake user research, usability testing and understand usage analytics in more detail. We're particularly keen to watch usage patterns over the coming months as here in Australia the academic year has only started this week. So all of the Genie usage to date has been based on smaller cohorts and more restricted use cases. And what is the bigger picture? Much of our future gazing will really focus on library research. I think. Since mid-2018, I've been asking myself the question, what does academic searching look like in a conversation-activated mobile IoT world? I don't have the answer to that question. We'll be conducting some blue sky research with students and academics later this year to explore what their ideal experience is in this new world. But it's a big and it's a complicated question. Products. Uh, as Steve mentioned before, such as Google Home, Amazon Alexa and so on, they were incredibly niche products when we first engaged in the Genie project in 2017. But since then, uh, they've become increasingly normalised. It's increasingly normal for people to ask their phone or other smart devices to complete actions and answer questions. And what does that mean for us as libraries? Where, has, where does the ab ability for a product like Genie to reduce administrative overload <coughs> begin and end? What impact can, will, should Genie and digital assistants more generally have on the digital literacy and research skill sets of our students and how do we ensure that library systems can handle this new world? Most systems haven't even dealt terribly well with mobile friendly interfaces yet whilst much of the commercial world moves beyond that in conversation design and digital assistance. So where do libraries fit in this space and how do we leverage these new technologies and expectations to our advantage? They are big questions and I don't have any answers for you at all. I don't think it's necessarily just one answer either. I do think that as an industry, these are the types of questions we need to be starting to really think about as we move forward. So that's it. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us speak about Deacon and Jeannie. We're very happy to uh, take questions now, but before I do, um, I'd just like to say that for those of you who are listening from the US, I expect to be heading over in June this year to visit a number of academic libraries, as well as to attend the ALA annual conference in Washington DC. So if anyone is interested in catching up in person to discuss this project or any other library projects or activities, I'd love to hear from you. So you can just send me an email. I'm very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. That was just a dynamite presentation. Uh, kudos to all of you uh, for sharing this information with us. Um, we uh, do have, uh, as Steve mentioned, we do have a link to share with you guys, uh, the fantastic video about Deacon Genie. I will uh, share that with folks um, in an email afterwards. 
Uh, we have about nine minutes to answer questions. We've had a number of questions uh, come in. Uh, we did have colleagues actually join us from the UK. I had said uh, earlier when we were chatting that I thought that that was unlikely, but we have some very um, uh, uh, colleagues with uh, quite a bit more stamina than, than I would have. So I'm going to turn to um, one of their questions. Uh, Masood from York University uh, asked a question that is top of mind, I think, for many of us, which is um, uh, questions about uh, data privacy and how you're dealing with that, um, concerns from students, concerns from uh, librarians, if you could just say a few words about uh, uh, data privacy concerns and how you're uh, dealing with those. Yeah, look, I can talk to that one. Um, Ginny is really just a, a way of accessing information that is already available. So Ginny, um, whatever you ask Ginny for, it either accesses information which is publicly available or you give your permission to for Genie and the app itself to access I'll say private information, for example, your timetable or, or the content within your units or that type of thing. So it's not actually it's not actually creating anything new. Um, from a I guess from a perspective of um, ensuring that we we respect people's privacy as universities are very risk averse places and we've certainly had a lot of conversations with the solicitors and making sure that we get our wording right um, as students enter the app. So we make it very clear that um, people will have access to you know, their records and, and return information from there but also that we won't be sharing that information with anybody else. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I think that this also falls into uh, one of those kind of um, large, big questions that we need to continue to discuss as a, as a community. Um, a couple of other questions that came up during the presentation. Um, how much data cleanup and interoperability work did you have to do before you were able to integrate um, features into into Genie, and thinking particularly about library services, but also um, any other any other areas where uh, integration needed to be um, uh, and remediation needed to be addressed. Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll take that one as well. That's it's a really good question, and it depends on the the end system that we're accessing for data. So many of our systems already have um, a range of APIs available which we can hit those APIs to, to get certain information and to return it. But in the cases of um, some information, there are particular things that we're looking for that we, we don't have access to an API. And we even had to, um, for something like uh, being able to send a notification to students when a lecturer posts a message, we, we didn't have an API available for that. We had to set up an alternative way of doing that. Um, which was a really um, labour-intensive uh, exercise. So, look, I guess I would answer that by saying it, it really depends on, on the systems that we're interacting with. But what I, what I would say from a content perspective, it's really challenged us um, to look at how and where we're, we're publishing content and, and, and how that content is structured and how we curate it. So, um, it forced us to do that when we commenced down this track with IBM Watson and it's continued um, with Genie as well. So it really, in, introducing something like this really does shine a light on where your deficiencies are um, from an information management perspective. Um, a related question, did you uh, have to create the library API middleware or did you, um, in, uh, were you able to interface directly with the vendor API? Sure. We, um, we already had a, um, our own library API that had been created for other purposes that, that um, kind of worked against the global API speaking to some of our vendor products, um, vendor APIs. So we were able to leverage that. Um, for, for the prescribed tech uh, work that we've done, at the moment we're directly using the vendor API. We've worked with them just to massage that where we've needed to. Um, but our intention is probably to incorporate that, 
add into our library API anyway and have a single API that will do a range of different things. Um, it's not that you can use the vendor APIs and our library API effectively does use um, our vendor API functionality, the bits that we want to use. It just kind of makes it neater for us to have it in one, one location. So it's a combination of both. We've been very fortunate that our, I think in libraries we do tend to have a lot of um, access to APIs. A lot of our vendors are doing that and that makes life a lot easier. And we use the Sierra library system, which now has APIs available. Um, so. Great. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, one is a pretty straightforward question. Can you use the Genie on a desktop, or is it uh, exclusively a mobile um, type of experience? Um, that's a really good question, um, and it's something which our um, our alpha customers in the commercial world are asking us for as well. We we don't have it available for a web interface at the moment. We do in, in for a test um, sort of version of Genie of how we test our conversations and, uh, and and our integrations, but we expect that to be developed during the course of this year. And in fact, in terms of where we're going with Genie and our digital products, we have a um, a student portal called Deacon Sync, which um, is the the one sort of web-based uh, portal that students are sent to. So we're looking at integrating the, the capabilities of Genie and also Scout, our, our wayfinding application, into that portal um, and, and reimagining how it functions. So that, that's the next big piece of work for us. Okay. Um, do you have a sense of how many of these conversations are a one-touch resolution versus multi-touch? And um, how many, do you have also a sense of how many uh, flow into a human interaction? That's a really good question. Um, look, I guess what I'd say with that is it's, it's, it's difficult to, to totally determine because we build conversations as assets. Um, that's really hard to explain on a webinar. But, um, for example, we, there'll be a conversation called contact library and we'll, we'll issue a contact card and then they'll have all of the contact channels. We don't build that multiple times into multiple conversations. We build it once and then we, we effectively link other conversations to that. So the reason why I'm, I'm telling you that is conversations trigger other conversations which can make it hard to determine exit points. What I would say is that um, probably at least half of the students that come to GD come to it ask for one thing and then leave, which is fine. That's actually the behaviour that we're expecting. We expected it to be a real quick, frictionless experience. I need to know one thing. I'm on the go. I'll check that one thing and then I'll pop out and I'll go and do other things. And I'll come back to it later. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess it's, it's also hard to determine how much tyre kicking behaviour is involved in the current experience. So I think as we've got so many new students on, Part of the reason why we have a lot of use of the common questions is people figuring out what can this thing do. So as the product matures, I think we're going to get a clearer picture of how many people come to it for just one thing versus stay and, and do two or three things. But at the moment, um, probably at least 50% come for one thing and then leave. Well, thank you so much. So that takes us pretty much exactly to time. So I want to once again um, thank our speakers. Thank you so much to our global, truly global um, audience today for your fantastic um, interaction and questions. Um, we will be sending around a link to the recording and other materials after the webinar. Um, and uh, we'll also uh, make uh, Danny's contact information available for those who are interested in perhaps connecting around ALA or when she's uh, in the States later this year. So uh, thank, thank you once again, and this concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us.